And for some analysis on all of the above, we're joined by Nia Malika Henderson of the Washington Post, New York Times White House correspondent Peter Baker, and Time International editor Bobby Ghost. Uh, Peter, you had a big story in the paper this morning about the sanctions. Uh, you heard Tony Blinken this morning. They're going to roll some of them out tomorrow. What do you anticipate here? And are they going to have any impact? Because so far, it seems to me, uh, they have it. Yeah. It, or maybe so, they have. Well, so far they've had a very limited uh, uh, approach to this. They're targeting particular individuals and particular institutions. You did hear Tony Blinken said they're going to try to go after some of the defense industry uh, uh, today, uh, tomorrow, which is going to be interesting to see. They're claiming credit uh, for these sanctions for all the economic problems Russia's having more generally. I don't know whether that's really a direct relationship or not. They argue it is. But you're, you're hearing a debate inside the administration, much like Bob Corker told you. Should they go stronger? Should they go to sectoral sanctions? That means going after whole sections of the Russian economy. Should they do something with more bite? And you heard Tony Blinken say they're waiting basically for Europe. They're trying to stay stitched together with Europe. They're not going to go beyond Europe. It's too important to them to keep them unified and keep Russia isolated, even at the expense of doing some of the tougher things that some people want them to do. Bobby, uh, uh, Blinken says this morning the, the allies, the Europeans are with us, but that's not entirely the case, is it? Yeah, they, they want to have a little bit of a distance. I think I'd, I'd much, I'm, I would like to hear what Angela Merkel has to say. Mm -hmm. I think Vladimir Putin would like to hear what Angela Merkel has to say, much more than what, what the Obama administration has to say. They've, they are also going along with small targeted sanctions, but the stakes are a lot higher for the Europeans. Um, Russia's trade with, with Europe is 10 times the size of Russia's trade with the U.S. He could also cut off the gas. And he could cut off the gas. And uh, yet that might not seem this much of, that much of a problem as we go into spring and summer, but uh, come the winter, he has the ability to make it very, very cold indeed, especially in Northern Europe. So they, they I think, are, are, would like to take little baby steps along the way and hope that that will have an impact. Uh, they're, they're, they seem to be comfortable with the Americans going harder and harsher um, but I don't think that that will change Putin's calculus. Yes, the, the Russian stock market is down. Yes, the Russian currency is down. It hasn't changed Putin's posture even a notch. And so it's going to take much, something of the order of, of getting Russians out of SWIFT, which is this interbanking deal that would essentially, that allows banks to trade currencies with each other. If you take Russia out of that union, then all of Russia's banks immediately go into sort of deep freeze. And something of that order might change, uh, might move the needle with Putin. But no one's proposing that yet. I want to talk a little bit about domestic politics and just go directly to it, because I want to play something for all of you this morning that uh, has already been seen on various places. But uh, it is very unusual, because you see Speaker John Boehner uh, talking about how tough it is to get people in his own party uh, to get on board on immigration. And uh, let's just listen to it. Here's the attitude. <laughs> oh, don't make me do this. Oh, this is too hard. You should hear him. <laughs> you know, we get elected to make choices. We get elected to solve problems. And it's uh, remarkable to me uh, how many of my colleagues just don't want to... They're human. You know, they're going to take the path of least resistance. <laughs> I mean, he's not talking about Democrats. No, he's, he's talking not. about he's people talking in his own about, party. What's yeah. happened here? Yeah, Has there been a, a epiphany on the road to Damascus here? Or this is like uh, something out of the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think John Boehner, we always knew where John Boehner stood on this, right? He has said over and over again that he wanted to see immigration reform done this year. He said it last year. Uh, but he went in January to his caucus and presented a plan uh, in Cambridge, Maryland, when he had their annual retreat, and he got a lot of no's. He got a lot of, you know, what he said there, which is a lot of whining and a, and a lot of sense that this wouldn't be good to do in an election year. I think everyone is looking at this in the broader context of John Boehner's future as Speaker of the House. Does he remain? It does seem like uh, there is a bit of a rebellion af afoot, 40 to 50 people sort of caucusing con conservatives, saying, is there someone who's more conservative who could take the helm uh, in November uh, after Boehner? Uh, and, and, you know, there are all sorts of, you know, whispering in, in Washington about whether or not he continues. He's got this house in Florida that he, he, he recently bought. Uh, so I think some people are seeing it in the context of that as well. well. You know, I mean, what's interesting, and I think all of us would agree on this, Republican leaders at the national level all know right. that if the Republican Party is going to remain a viable 
uh, party as far as electing national leaders, it's going to have to make some accommodation on immigration because the demographics, it just can't succeed otherwise. But we also know that most uh, members of Congress who are Republicans are in, in districts where there are very few Hispanics. So voting against reform is a very easy a vote for him. So what what's happening here, uh, Peter? Do you see this? Is is Boehner getting ready to say goodbye here, or is he really trying, as uh, Nia Malika suggests? Yeah. Even one of his allies said maybe he's just getting ready for that condo in Florida. I think the, I think he's obviously expressing frustration he's been feeling for a long time, right. and it comes out more easily in his home district where he feels comfortable with his own people than it does, say, in a national setting on a talk show like this. Uh, but, you know, whether that frustration leads him to try to do something about it, it's a different question. Right. You know, can he enforce uh, discipline in his caucus to go the direction he wants? Now, the direction he wants isn't necessarily the same as President Obama. He has different ideas. He'd like to do it in pieces rather than in one big bill. But you could see where he and President Obama could come to a, an agreement if he had more flexibility. He doesn't have that right well, now. Well, do either or any of you uh, see this Congress actually taking up immigration? Because, you know, they have said earlier this year there would be no immigration reform. And so far, they've pretty much held to that. They, there's no, no nothing. Yeah. They've all gone yeah. home and said, we'll be back after the election. But do you see uh, them turning back to immigration now? I can't imagine that they would. And the closer we get to the election, the less likely they are, for the reasons you explained. It's not popular with each individual congressman. It's not popular in their home district. It's not going to get them reelected. It's, if, if there is any talk of reform, it makes their chances of reelection that much more precarious. So no, I, I don't expect them to come back. It's a different yeah. electorate for the midterm elections than right. the presidential elections. They don't feel that they need to do this necessarily for this fall because it's a smaller, uh, more Republican electorate than you get in a presidential year. They might want to come back in the lame duck. They might want to come back in spring of 2015 and feel more pressure at that point to yeah. act. I mean, and it could be when, you know, after the November elections, the Republicans have a pretty good chance of actually taking the Senate. You know, it's been right. 60, 65 uh, percent chance. And it could be that we see, uh, you know, a Senate com uh, controlled by the Republicans, a House controlled by the Republicans, uh, and this realization that Republicans need to do immigration reform and blunt this issue as, an, uh, as a campaign issue. What do they think over at the White House? Do they think that the uh, Republicans may actually capture the Senate? Uh, they wouldn't say it here, but yeah. yes, I think they do, and I think that they're worried about that a lot. It goes by the week. Some weeks they're more yeah. optimistic than others. Um, but yeah, I think that they see that as a, as a real possibility and a, and a pretty frustrating final two years for President Obama's term uh, laying ahead if that happens. I don't know what the question is. I would just <laughs> the Los Angeles Clippers yeah. owner and this stupid, if I may use that term, uh, remark that he is caught on tape saying, I understand a spokesman put out a thing and said the tape does not reflect his real feelings. Well, apparently it's his voice, yeah, but yeah, I guess I they're suggesting yeah. maybe it was edited or something. Yeah, I mean, I guess Adam Silver, uh, who is the commissioner of the NBA, he's got to verify whether or not uh, that is his voice. The Clippers p play this afternoon against the Golden State Warriors. Doc Rivers has, has said uh, that the protest will be their play. Some people, like LeBron James, have said, listen, you know, maybe they shouldn't play. Magic Johnson has come out to say that he'll never go to a Clippers game again. But, I mean, you know, that, after the Clive and Bundy thing, we've mm -hmm. had these real high-profile examples of, I mean, what is just racism? Yeah, 50 years after the Civil Rights Act, yeah. this is not. This is still a live issue, and uh, and it puts people in a difficult position, right? Politicians who are have, have supported, you know, uh, the the rancher you mentioned yeah. uh, for other reasons, now suddenly put on the hot seat. Do you agree with this? Well, of course I don't agree with that. Of course we don't want to have anything to do with that. And now the NBA is going to be put in, in the hot spot. Where does the where does free speech end? And 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 having some sort of civil, you know, uh, uh, conversation with your, you know, with your most popular uh, stars right. and the and the people who watch the game, who yeah. all of whom find, many of whom anyway, find this very offensive. So, You know, uh, getting back to Republican politics, uh, Jeb Bush is apparently now thinking about running. <laughs> and, you know, I, uh, I have a source that told me that if Jeb Bush decides not to run, that Mitt Romney mm -hmm. may actually uh -huh. try it again. Wow, wow. Uh, third time. Uh, because uh, they're very concerned that the party is is not moving forward, that the party has moved so far to the right that, you know, they can't elect a presidential candidate. Right. Now, whether any of this happens or not, what do you think, Bob? Well, I think if he, if he does run again, what we learned the, uh, the second time he ran was that he moved more to the right. And I suspect if he runs for a third time, we'll see that continue. He'll, he'll move even further to the right to try and appeal to those remaining few 
uh, percentages of the party that did not embrace him the last time around. So uh, if they're seeing him as a as a centrist, as a as somebody who can who can gather all the different strings of the party together, I don't I don't think the evidence supports that. It's a, it suggests that he will move even further and a further way towards more and more extreme positions, and that's not going to be good for the. I suspect not going to be good for the party. We should talk a little bit about the president's trip to Asia. Uh, it's been dominated by other news. At yeah. every stop, he gets asked about something else. But uh, was this a success? Uh, what what was it? I think we're beginning finally. He, he's been talking about it for a while, but we are finally beginning to see what his Asia pivot looks like. And it's, it's interesting you say that he's been he's been overshadowed by by events. But the important thing is that that trip and everything he's been saying in that trip not directed at the American public. It's directed at one specific audience, that is China. And you can be sure that in China they're following very, very closely. They are not distracted by things like the LA Clippers guy or or uh, other do American domestic policy. They are paying very close attention. He has made it very clear in Japan that he supports Japan over China on the disputed islands. This military deal that he's about to sign tomorrow in the Philippines is of enormous significance. It gets American military back in that part of the world after 25 years. Well, thank you all. There's no shortage of things to talk about. We could continue all afternoon. We'll be right back with a report from Rome about the two popes who became saints today.